And I'm going to welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we are continuing our journey on examining the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. And at this point, you know, we're at, we're at, I think it's part 14 or something like that. And at this point, part 14, you might be asking, Michael, you, you must really love this sutra. It's the longest you've spent on any sutra. And it's not, I've never taught this sutra. I've barely read the sutra before I started doing this. It's not so much about the sutra as it is about this, what, the, what I'm doing, what this is episode 14 of is our deep dive in the exploration of the Bodhisattva path. That's what I'm so excited about. So it's not so much that this sutra is really, really great. It's just a very complete schematic of the whole bodhisattva path, a lot of the bodhisattva lore, um, bodhisattva ideas surrounding the bodhisattva. Um, and so it's just this really clean presentation of all these ideas. It's sort of like you know, we've talked about a bunch of beautiful ideas and many of them, it'll be a whole sutra on just that idea or just that paramita, you know, the paramita of giving. There'll be a whole sutra just on that. And it actually is kind of difficult to find a nice sutra that covers the whole thing in such a complete way. So again, that's actually what we're doing here is just using this sutra as an excuse to discuss this bodhisattva path. I've been trying to, um, certainly I've been trying to do that in that way of really contextualizing this squarely within the Mahayana, the Mahayana, right, the great vehicle. And I think, I never really know where these Dharma talks are going. You might, you might think I have a plan, but I don't. I, I, I know where we're going to start, and then we see where it goes. And so last week, I started going through a list of 30, oh no, another list, but a list of 30, well, this is where it gets tricky. Like what are, what is this list? They are 30 ways of thinking about this idea of a paramita. And of course, that's what this sutra has been all about. I've changed uh, my background here for tonight, uh, a, a slightly less, uh, dense. It gives me a little more room in the frame, but I'm using an earlier uh, whiteboard from, I think this is part like one or two, where we actually were discussing this Chinese character, which is this idea to generate or bring forth this bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. And bodhicitta, bodhisattva, a being of enlightenment, a mind of enlightenment. There's a very, very close connection between those. And so that's how this sutra started was Bodhisattva Akshayamati asking, how do you fa, that's this Chinese character, how do you generate or bring forth this mind of enlightenment? And the Buddha's simple answer was, well, by observing, practicing, or doing these 10 paramitas. And then the Buddha, after telling us about the 10 paramitas, then gives us 10 practices for each of those. And yes, we went through the 100 dharmas associated with these 10 paramitas. Then we got to last week, where the Buddha then begins to give these series of kind of synonyms or, or, or ways of thinking about paramita in general. So not dana giving and not moral discipline and not patience and not determination and drive wisdom meditation and so not the the paramitas themselves but the buddha started talking about but what does this mean paramita and so the buddha said well it means and then it means to clearly realize and surpass the ways of the shravakas and solitary enlightened ones, uh, to develop broad and great Buddha knowledge. And he starts giving, the Buddha starts to give all of these different ways of thinking about this idea of paramita. 
And last time I spent a, a little bit of time talking about the traditional etymology of this word paramita, that it has this connotation of crossing over or ferrying over or um, yeah, just kind of going beyond, kind of uh, overcoming a lot of significance and meaning to this word paramita. And traditionally, of course, the meaning of to cross over paramita was crossing over out of samsara to nirvana. That was the basic idea. And a paramita was something that could do that, something that could bring you out of samsara and deliver you to nirvana. And I may not have mentioned this, I eh, probably men mentioned it at some point, but paramitas are part of, have always been a part of the Buddhist tradition. So I don't want you to think that paramitas are some newfangled Mahayana stuff. Not at all. Paramitas are very much a part of their early tradition. Even the, the, the not quite sure how to call this, but even the structure of six paramitas, but in some cases, 10 paramitas, that's also part of the early tradition. The specific paramitas actually shift a little bit from either school to school or even sometimes from sutra to sutra. But I just want you to know that this idea of to, you know, it's not really a verb, but the to paramita, to cross over, that's all we, that's, that's what we're talking about. Out of suffering to non-suffering, out of ignorance to enlightenment, that, all of that idea of that movement and I guess one way of beginning this talk tonight is looking at these 30, these 30, again, you know, analogs or similes or, you know, but these 30 examples of what paramita means, these are all very much within the language of the Mahayana. Okay, so this is I guess what I'm giving you is this idea that paramita has always been a part of the Buddhist tradition. This sutra would sort of assume that you know that, assume you know all about paramitas, but it's also probably assuming that you haven't heard Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. And so when the Buddha starts listing these, um, the like, I guess what I'm getting at is that if you were a Shravaka, if you were sort of a follower of an early form of Buddhism, that more hardcore renunciatory, uh, today we would call it like the Theravada tradition, but that really like hardcore renunciatory path. If you were that type of Buddhist, you were a meditator, meditating hardcore, you know, going through your jhanas and, and doing all of that. The idea is, is that you, if you, again, if you were of the old school, you would read this and you would be like, whoa, what, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Especially for example, and, and not, to, not to jump too far ahead, but for example, when we get down the list quite a bit, we find that the paramita means to abide neither in samsara nor nirvana. And, and so that's to abide neither in samsara nor nirvana. That's one of the 30. And I guess, oh, look at that. We're starting there. So the, I, get the, I guess the reason why I'm starting there is because the entire early form of Buddhism, that really, again, hardcore renunciatory path you know, that again is sort of still with us a little bit in, in certain forms like the Theravadan of Southeast Asia. But that early tradition was entirely about escaping samsara and going to nirvana. And not that, and I don't wanna actually linguistically say that it's not going to nirvana like it's a place, like it's a, a lost Hawaiian island, right? It's not a place. It is, of course, nirvana as a state of being, which is the extinguishing, quelling, cessation of desire and suffering in that way. That's sort of the idea of nirvana. 
is that the flame, the burning flame of wanting, the burning flame of anger, the burning of delusion or confusion has been pss, quelled, put out. There is no longer a burning flame of desire. And so there's no longer a kind of accumulation of karma in that way. And so all there is to do is live a life in nirvana, in that state. And then when the body decays, that is pari nirvana, final nirvana, gone. That's the early form, out of suffering to nirvana. And the entire practice is about transporting you out of your suffering to non-suffering, to a state of non-suffering. That is what the early path is about. For this sutra, and in many ways for the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path, for the Bodhisattva to neither abide in samsara nor nirvana, oh, that's kind of a twist. That's a little like, wait a minute. I thought the Buddha was about getting to nirvana. I thought that was all, it was all about, the, it was about that. And you're telling me now that paramita, a, a kind of um, a cool way to think of paramita is that it is neither abiding in samsara nor nirvana. Oh, wow, now we've really gone beyond, right? And that is sort of part of what's going on here is a sort of what would be called like a, a kind of non-duality or a non-dualism in that way. Sure, sure. Where we have samsara, nirvana, that's a duality, right? And so that idea of being trapped in polarities or tra trapped in dualities, that's samsara. And so we're trying to get out of that trapped in duality. And so there's kind of one way in which the bodhisattva is trying to play that kind of non-duality card. Arguably, the original concept of nirvana is non-duality, is already that non-duality card. You, we could get into some really nerdy like discussion about whether that early nirvana is the same non-dual state that is being spoken about right now. Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's not actually as interesting or important to kind of speculate about what nirvana like really is, okay? It's actually, that's not actually what's very interesting right here because we're not actually, mm, I mean, again, we could get nerdy and be really interested in this, but what I mean to say is, is that we are approaching this as practitioners. We are approaching this as un the unenlightened. So we're not gonna presume full enlightenment here, but we're saying, no, we're, you know, suffering human beings in that way, all suffering in our own unique way. And the idea is this sort of, um, I, I suppose to say, just to comment on this idea of abiding in neither samsara nor nirvana, it's sort of about this idea of when I'm a cultivator or practitioner and I'm not enlightened yet, it may not be entirely helpful to have such dichotomous ideas and views as samsara, the suffering, and nirvana. And what seems to have happened historically a number of things actually seem to have happened historically, but one of them is that the early path, which in our sutra we're calling the followers of that path, shravakas, voice hearers, yeah? The, the commentary or the critique, so to speak, of that path was that it got very, very, and in some instances still is, very negative and down about this world, the things of this world, um, everything that goes along with this world is sort of, well, of course, you know this if you are sort of more steeped in the early tradition, you know this about the three marks of existence, this idea that everything is impermanent, everything's without a self, but most importantly, everything's a source of suffering. So this whole samsara situation 
is considered sort of very negative in that way. And then you know, nirvana is a, oh, nirvana, oh, nirvana, right? It's like, so that is what started to happen is like Buddha is nirvana, ooh, Buddha, ooh, Buddha, samsara, oh, samsara sucks, bad. And then just like any good religion, just like any good religion, they just start rolling in a bunch of other things into that. I've commented on this in the past, but basically this is where the early tradition becomes very obsessed with sexuality as the problem. And then what happens when you get a bunch of guys sitting around talking about the problem of sexuality is that they, they form this, uh, the He-Man Woman Haters Club, basically. And that's basically one of the things, that, again, there are many things that happened, but the early Buddhist tradition seems to have become very hierarchical, very um, sexist and non-egalitarian in that way, very dualistic, very, very dualistic as far as the world, bad, nirvana, good, kind of an idea. And then also just on top of that, there was a kind of a little additional critique of those shravakas and that path as just being kind of a downer, <laughs> like just kind of really, you know, like down. And so I don't, you know, this is not a history class in that way. So we're not speculating about the origins of Mahayana, but I am trying to contextualize some of the sutra and the reason why the sutra is a little critical, if not very critical, of these so-called shravakas. Because the idea is, is that they are tra trapped in this dualistic meditation cult. <laughs> They're, it's a little sexist, very hierarchical. And there is one piece of the shravaka puzzle that is also very important, comes up a lot. Comes up a lot in the sutra, comes up a lot in general. That early Buddhist path, the Shravaka path, it gets critiqued for being, well, it's basically, it is a path. If you, if you are familiar, for example, with the Visuddhimagga, the Visuddhimagga is not a sutra, it is a commentary on, a sut on sutras in general, it's a commentary actually on the whole practice, and the, the path of purification, that's what it means, the Visuddhimagga. Um, if you're really interested in the early Buddhist path of purification, that's the book that you need to read. It is, I, I often call it, it's like the Dr. Spock's guide for being an adult. So not the Dr. Spock's guide for your baby, but it's like the Dr. Spock's guide for being a human. Everything they didn't teach you in school about your emotions and what they're doing to you, all of this stuff. But the point is, is that there's this manual, the Visuddhimagga, which is a, a, a very amazing uh, text, but it's a, a beautiful summary of the Theravada or that Shravaka Yana path in that way. But if you look at the Visuddhimagga and you look at the Theravada tradition and you look at that practice, it is all about your enlightenment. It is only about your pure, the pur purification of your karma. That's what the path is about. And in fact, as an Indian religious tradition, there is a very interesting economy of salvation, we could call it. And the economy of salvation is that the practice is to purify your karma basically and by karma i mean your actions and so you are purifying the voice by avoiding false speech harsh speech divisive speech you are purifying your body by not committing harm you are purifying 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 and you're just purifying until you are so pure you're an arhat in nirvana and as part of that economy of salvation i just mentioned the purer you get the more car, uh, the more merit you can get, give other people if they give you stuff. 
So if I'm a monk and I've been working on my karma and purifying and purifying, and I'm a, I'm a chakra dagaman, right? Like a once returner or an anagaman, a non-returner even. I've purified my karma so much I can claim I'm only going to be reborn one more time. In fact, I can claim that I'm never going to be reborn again as a human. I'm so pure that if you give me some food or clothing, it, 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 like magic, you get this merit as a layperson. And what that means in the early economy of salvation for early Buddhism, if you, a layperson, gave me a non returner, gave me something that gets you some merit. And if you get enough good merit from helping me in your next life, you can be reborn as a monk. And then you can do the real practice and purify yourself until you are purified. What I'm getting at is that the early tradition is entirely self-help. And I don't mean that like derogatory in the sense that like it's, it's, uh, it's just like um, whatever. This is very, very important information, that early school. But it is entirely focused on the purification of the karmic axis of the self. Through the realization that there is no self, that's a big part of it, sure. But the irony is, is that the, the focus may, is, it stays right here in the purification of the bodily actions of this being, the vocal actions of this being, the mental karma of this being, and it's about this. And, you know, again, I'm not knocking that at all. It, we should all be doing that. We should all be reading the Visuddhi Magga and figuring out kind of how to purify ourselves, ourselves in that way. That's good. But there's a reason why this Mahayana seems to have arisen. One, two, and three, all the examples I gave before, non-egalitarianism, the hierarchicalism, the dualism, all of that. So this Mahayana comes along and it's like, you know what, this whole thing's gotten too institutional. You know what, we're not really practicing what the Buddha taught because we're really discriminating men from women and you know what? We're actually being very dualistic in all of these ways. And <laughs> the big one for the Bodhisattva is that I guess this is this is where I want to make my, my statement tonight. Right here, we'll make the, the theme for tonight. There's this way in which it almost is, is if you look at it the right way, that early tradition is like, I'm going to meditate and purify myself. And by doing that, I'm going to help other people because they'll be able to get merit through me. Right. But there's this way in which I almost don't get to start helping others until I'm done. Like until I'm purified, and then I can do that. What's interesting is that the Bodhisattva path starts with the paramita of giving. It starts with the practice of the other. And in fact, the way that you would purify yourself is entirely through this kind of socially engaged Buddhism as Thich Nhat Hanh calls it. Socially engaged Buddhism, of course, is sort of a modern term, but it is a, a great descriptor of what this is, a very socially engaged type of Buddhism where the practice is in exchange with others through giving. That's one big one. It's why it's the first paramita. The first paramita, meaning that the bodhisattva path begins with not necessarily with dhyana, meditation. It begins with giving. The, and what in previous Dharma talks I call, or in previous Dharma talks, I clarify that it may be that you're actually taking something and giving it to somebody. Sure, that's dana, but dana for the bodhisattva, giving, giving your attention is often way better than giving something. Giving love, giving compassion, giving respect, giving in so many different ways. 
And in fact, what you could do, and this is my Dharma talk on giving earlier, the giving isn't even necessarily an act. It is what I call a disposition of the heart. It's, a, it's, it's about a disposition of generosity, a disposition of giving, where you're almost kind of like, anybody need any help? You need any help? You need any help? Because I'm ready. I'm like, I'm ready to like, so the disposition is one of generosity that then because you're, you're ready, you know, it might, you, it might be giving somebody attention. It might be giving somebody a plot, like all different kinds of things in that way. And that's a very profound practice. Indeed, it's a paramita. And in fact, I said this uh, at some point at one of these nights, I said, there's a really kind of beautiful, almost fractal way that you can start looking at these 10 paramitas as just fractally one practice with 10 facets, perhaps this beautiful diamond, diamond of a practice, right? With these 10 facets, you could look at it that way, which is fun and cool. But what I was actually about to say was that there's also a way that not just that these are all 10, the same practice, but if you did one all the way, that would probably be good enough <laughs> is the idea. And so the idea is, is um, what I'm getting at is that within this Bodhisattva Mahayana tradition, any one of these is a transcendent practice in that way. So I'm gonna pause there for some questions, answers, comments, epiphanies, realizations. You may, everybody chilling? Everybody's chilling. I'll say something. Okay, what you got now? Yeah, I, I, so I really want to thank you for that clarification. I think I sort of had a sense of that, that bodhisattvas didn't, you know, it's not just the, the distinction between a bodhisattva being in it for themselves or being, you know, solitary or being um, uh, self-centered. It's not just that they're in it to, to also support other beings, all beings, right? But that they're doing that simultaneously and that, that that in fact is part of how they get their own self together. So that, that was really, uh, thank you for that. That was really useful for me to hear. I don't have a question. I just no, no. Thank, thank you for reiterating that. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that that landed or came across. Yeah, Tanya. I was just gonna say, I just also really like the fact that it doesn't, the Mahayana, and this is just my own kind of gut reaction. It doesn't sound so transactional. Mm. You know, like the, you know, whereas like, you know, if you give the monk the food, then you're like getting merit. And it, it just seems very, and I, I, I guess I'm being judgmental in the way that I'm looking <laughs> at it. But for me, it just, um, I, I really, the, the Mahayana resonates more. Indeed, and it's why I teach it. And it's why I do these sutras and, and that, because I know that, you know, the Theravada, that path has a lot of representatives, a lot of public teachers. That's very available in the modern mindfulness world, that practice and that idea. And again, I am not putting it down. It's not about that. It, it's, it's really not. And so Tanya, that idea of like, you know, it's not, yeah, it's not about that. It really, and it, it, it most everybody knows that comes to the Dharma doors, you know that I kind of started all this as a historian and scholar and sort of drifted into more of the Dharma practitioner, teacher guy thing that I am here. But that first, the, you know, the, what I've learned from that history is that 2,500 years is a long time. <laughs> and so this Buddhism has changed and morphed and has kept a lot and has lost a lot and changed a lot. And a lot of this Mahayana stuff is reacting to an earlier form of Buddhism that isn't actually so active today. So what I mean is, is I'm always hesitant to say actually Theravada because the Theravada has actually changed and adapted 
a lot over the last 2000 years, pretty much in response to Mahayana in certain ways and certain things. So I, I really want to make clear that when I say, you know, that the, the, the tradition's not egalitarian, I'm talking about the Buddhists from 300 BC and there's, and there's um, uh, tracts, there's, there's uh, manuscripts where they're bragging on them for being too hierarchical. So I'm talking about that historical moment, not, although the Theravada tradition has certain problems as well regarding male femaleness, but I digress. <laughs> yeah, Dean. Yeah, uh, question, Michael, going back to the uh, abiding neither in samsara or in nirvana, which is, I love that, just that sentence. Um, I wondered if, if we would consider that to be like, what, you know, like, wow, that's very hard to do, but hopefully someday we'll be able to do that. Or is it more like, just, you know, try it, see if you can try it, just, you know, like, like, accept that maybe you are doing that. How, how hard is it to do that? Awesome question, Dean. Awesome question. It, it really is the perfect question. So that, again, that, that one, that uh, to, uh, to abide neither in samsara nor nirvana is one of these 30 definitions of paramita. And so actually, I really want to, yeah, this is a good one. All right, this is it. <laughs> so I know uh, many of you know the, um, okay, how are we gonna put all these pieces together? So many of you know the beautiful Brahmajala Sutra, otherwise known as the Sutra on the 62 Erroneous Views. One of the best sutras. In fact, it's the first sutra in the Diga Nikaya. It's like, it's, a, it's huge, right? It's a major sutra. Um, Brahmajala Sutra, Brahma's Net, otherwise known as what the teaching is not, sometimes it's called. And it's in that sutra where the Buddha really clearly articulates this idea of not clinging to or being attached to a view, a drishti, right? And what is so profoundly subtle, so, oh, and by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll back up. So in Buddhism, and in Indian uh, philosophy in general, but Buddhism really specifically, they talk a lot about these drishti. And a drishti is, the word drishti means a gaze. And if you've ever done yoga, you might have heard of a drishti because your yoga teacher might ask you to, to fix your drishti on the wall ahead, ahead of you or on your feet or on your, your fingertip if you're doing like a pointing pose. So the word drishti literally means a gaze or a view, but just like in English, the word view can literally mean with your eyes and that that's a great view. Or in English, we say, well, that's just his view. That's just his view. And that view means that, that idea of a, a worldview, I don't want to call it an opinion because it's actually a drishti is much stronger than an opinion. A drishti is like, well, if you read the Brahmajala Sutra, it's a really a clear explanation of what a drishti is. But a, a view, meaning a drishti, a, a, is a is a hardened, a hard, fast belief. And in fact, it's not even a belief. So forget opinion, forget belief. A drishti is, it's your view. It's like just the default mode of how you perceive reality. And in particular, because I know a lot of you study with me and we're not talking about emptiness and all that. When I say the view of reality, it's more about values, what you value, what you don't value, what you think is imper important, not important, right and wrong for that, for that matter. And we all have a drishti to, well, unless barring any upper level bodhisattvas that are beyond their drishti, but for the most part, we all have 
our views. And again, they're so assumed that they almost are us, ourselves in a way. Because they're again, they're about what we value and what we think are, is important. And so, you know, things like um, political views are drishtis. <clears throat> you have conservative values and you believe this is important, or you have liberal values and you think, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech is important. And if you think freedom of speech is important, that's a view. And again, it's like it's a it's a baseline. It's not like you have to think, it's like everything's going from your view in that way. So in the Brahmajala Sutra, the Buddha goes through these 62 <laughs> different views of the world. And they are, they are mainly actually about what happens after we die. Some of them are actually about what happens before we are born, sort of like where we came from, like in terms of one view is about reincarnation. The other is about the um, stitching together of material to make a self. Regarding demise, there's one view that we go to heaven. There's one view that we just go ran around around reincarnation. There's one view that we're just, uh, you know, fancy matter and we fall apart. So the Buddha lists all 62 of these competing drishtis, these competing views for basically what's going on here. And he basically says they're all erroneous. They're all off. And in that sutra, and as part of the whole tradition, there is this very profound practice that is, is going to get me right back to Dean's question, I promise. But this profound practice is to not have a fixed view. It's one of those ones where it's like, huh, <laughs> okay. But the idea here is, is that we all do have a view and for the most part, we are kind of clinging to it. And, you know, there's no better test than this, you know, than that good old proverbial cocktail party where you might talk to somebody that has a different view, a different political view, a different religious view, a different dietary view. And it's when we get into those and we encounter somebody with the other view or opposite view of us that we really find out about our attachment to views or not. You know, how, how quick are you to defend your view? How quick are you to defend your dietary choices or your political views or whatever? So that clinging or attachment to a fixed view according to the Buddha, is problematic for a number of reasons. Primarily, it causes us stress and anxiety, otherwise known as dukkha or suffering, that actually clinging to that view causes us distress, causes us anxiety and suffering in that way. And so the profundity, the profound teaching of the Buddha is to not have a fixed view. And that's kind of a really wild practice. And it's wild for a number of reasons, but here's the main one. Don't have a fixed view. Got it. I got it. Great. I'm not going to have a fixed view. That's perfect. Oh, I did it. I turned it into a fixed view. I did the thing that I'm not supposed to do. Even the thing, even the wisdom about not having, having a fixed view, I digressed and turned it into my fixed view. Oh, darn. So you mean the Buddha means I have to really do this? You mean the, the Buddha was serious when he was talking about non-attachment? Really? So what I'm getting at is that to not have a fixed view is not as easy as just setting your mind and being like, okay, I'm gonna be the type of person that doesn't have a fixed view. You failed already. You are now digressed into having a fixed view about what's good and what's wrong. Da, 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 da. To really, really, really not have a fixed view is, it's a practice and you have to do it all the time. And we get better at it and we might regress and slip back into some attachment to views, but then we loosen up a bit. And that, that 
position of of it's like a wild position to be in where you're where you're it's like okay i have this view so i'm gonna let go of that view but i can't go grab a, another view i literally kind of have to stay in what did he call it the middle path <laughs> i like literally have to stay in this very agile um i don't even know how to put it i mean it's really one of those things that is a practice. And again, we really don't really notice it until we encounter through conversation or otherwise something that rubs up against our view. And then we would notice whether we're clinging to a view or not. Versus, a, and oh, and, and I need to say this too, we are not talking about putting your views in a bucket and lighting them on fire, <laughs> right? And what I mean is, is that this is still Buddhism. So we're being very gentle and very compassionate towards other and ourselves in that way. And so it's a very gentle release of these things. And an example I got, I, I give this example all the time, but I, I, I went through it myself. So it's coming from a deep, uh, deeply personal place and it has to do with dietary choices. So the example I use a lot is veganism the so not eating animal not consuming animal products in, in any way right so if i were to and i was once a card carrying member of the the vegan world i had my soapbox everything so i had a, that view and i was one of those people that i would let you know my view i i tried to be a wise person in the way that I delivered it, but I, I believed very strongly in my view. I was very um, uh, vocal about that view if asked in that way. And so very much had the view. And of course, part of the view, the, having that view that veganism is right, right? Having that view, what comes along with that, of course, is a kind of identification, an identity. So now I've got a name, Michael, and now I also have an identity. I'm a vegan, right? So, or, and then I could throw the, I'm a Democrat and I could throw a couple more on there too, right? To really round out my identity, like really nicely, right? So I'm, a, I'm the democratic vegan Buddhist teacher named Michael, right? So that's who I am. And the idea is of course, referring to a bunch of other Dharma talks, that's not a really good mode to be in that identity mode. It's clingy as well. And so what I want to share with you, though, is this really interesting idea. Having the view of veganism and identifying as a vegan. Yes, you can do it that way. And that means you have your diet, right? But could you imagine, try to imagine, making a vow to avoid harm, making a vow, making that Buddhist vow to avoid violence and harm. Okay. And now can you imagine not having the view of veganism, not holding on to it, not identifying as a vegan, but actually sitting down to each meal and being mindful about what you're doing and asking yourself, is this in line with my vow? This is in line with my vow, eat away. What I'm getting at is that to abandon the view and I ban to abandon the identity does not abandon the practice. Meaning if you're a vegan, meaning if you think that that's really important, all the the dharma or all the buddha is suggesting is that you do it without that clinging to your self-righteousness about your view in that way do it without the clinging to that sense of right and this is the really key one too there's a way in which when we take on an identity like say i'm a vegan there's this way in which it's like okay that's solved 
And now, you know, I just look at the label, is it vegan or whatever? And I can kind of actually check out a little bit. Whereas the other one that I described, where you actually have to think uh, before each meal and ask yourself, is this in align with my vow? That's sort of not checking out. That's having to be really present with everything that you're eating at every moment in that way. And so I just want to make it really clear that to abandon a view does not necessarily mean to abandon that activity or that practice. It's just some, some kind of extra baggage that you don't actually need to do that thing. So I still need to get back to Dean's question though, because what I wanted to do was use that example of the Brahmajala Sutra of not having a fixed view, which is puts one in this kind of middle pathy situation where, yo, oh, I got to really think I've got to actually be on my guard and my mind in terms of my clinging habits and mental habits in that way. And so that situation that is, if I've, if I've explained it right, it's a very interesting place to be in. And it's not unlike that place the Bodhisattva sits in regard to samsara and nirvana. So Dean, your question, yeah, uh, try it. Meaning the idea here is, is that that that, that thing that I just said about not clinging to the view, but being more like this about it, it's the same in regards to the idea of the suffering and the suffering world and nirvana and peace and tranquility. And rejecting this, clinging to that or something, that's the movement that's the movement that the bodhisattva is avoiding, this sort of um, dropping this, clinging that, moving here or there. And so neither abiding in samsara nor nirvana is this kind of truly exalted situation where one is not in the world of suffering. So you're, you're beyond that. You're not, you know, you're just not as clinging to the stuff of this world, not clinging to the views, not clinging in that way. But you're also not clinging for nirvana, striving for nirvana, or even in a way putting a dualism of those up anymore. So this is like not having a fixed drishti and and you know plus ultra. It just it's like that whole disposition of the middle path. And by the way, I did use say an example at some point. I think it was, I, I start to get confused, right? Might have been last week, but I mentioned at some point that beautiful um, simile because it's like the person who's lost in the woods, right? I think I, I ended last time with this. It's this beautiful story about someone being lost in the woods and they don't know north, south, east from west. They don't have a compass cloudy night, there's no stars, absolutely lost. <gasps> the saying or the, the Buddha says, the moment the person doesn't care where they're going, they're no longer lost. Just like that. This bodhisattva position between samsara and nirvana is very much like that person that's no longer lost. And it's this, the idea of course is, is you know, it's sort of, um, well, it's quite, re quite religious language, right? To speak of, I was, I was lost. I, once I was lost, now I'm found, right? That's sort of a saying. And it's a metaphor within many spiritual religious traditions, the idea of being lost, being found. Interestingly, you take this Buddhist example of being lost in the woods and not knowing north, south, east from west. Being lost, being afraid, being alone, that's samsara. And so the idea is it's like nirvana has got to be around here somewhere. Is it over there? Is it over there? Like, where's it at? I, I'm not going to really be able to be satisfied until I know where nirvana is. And of course, the beauty of this story is you're in nirvana, dude. 
<laughs> you're already there. And that's definitely part of this message of neither in samsara nor nirvana, because it's this sort of total release of those ideas, which puts one kind of squarely in the real nirvana. I dare not. I dare not. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that idea. But OK, so we've tackled one of these. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, ideas on the uh, sort of samsara nirvana idea? Middle path, views. Cool. So I'm going to then, I'm probably, OK. I wanted to go back to the, lit, the, the list of 30. And there's just a few real juicy ones in here that I wanted to, to talk about. Like I said last time, any one of these could easily be an hour and a half. I mean, we were already pushing quite a long time just on that one. And I almost am like tempted to do this, um, meaning one of these a night, um, but I won't do I won't do that to you. <laughs> but I did want to just say a few, and I think I read the whole list last time, so I'm not going to read them all again. The, the sixth one, just to give you one quick idea, the sixth one is what does paramita mean? Oh, it means to obtain the inexhaustible dharma treasury of the Buddha. That's what it means. And I just wanted to pause on that one for a moment because of that language of the inexhaustible treasury of the dharma of the Buddha. This, of course, is the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, whose name means inexhaustible intellect. And the idea of inexhaustibility, inexhaustible, just keeps going and going and going. That is a very key adjective in Mahayana Buddhism. Inexhaustibility, just infinite, basically. And for, the, for Paramita to mean the obtaining of the inexhaustible treasury of the Dharma of the Buddha, it's sort of like, again, this could be a very long lecture, but I just want to share this one idea of inexhaustibility. It goes very much with this, well, it goes very much with this idea of emptiness that we talked a little bit about last time, but in particular, we spent a little bit of time last time talking about I think we talked, yeah, we talked about it, but this kind of idea of, of things coming into existence, being, and then going out of existence. It's the normal way that we think these things go. People are born, they live, and then they die. Objects are manufactured or made, they exist, they break, and then they no longer exist. And so that view of things as arising and ceasing, right? as dharmas, objects, things, phenomena, the view or seeing them as arising and ceasing is something that we've talked about as being some, somewhat like an illusion or a delusion, right? And I used, one night I used the example of my fist and I talked about this idea of like, where did the fist come from? And then better yet, where did it go? Where to come from? Where to go? If you're if you're thinking that way about the fist, that it's an object that came from somewhere, and then and then just oh, oh, oh where to go? Like if you're looking for it, you don't understand the nature of the fist. If you're looking for where it went, then you don't don't understand its conditional nature. And it's conditional nature is that it's, first of all, it's conditional based on the configuration of fingers. If they're like this, you got a fist. If they're like this, you ain't got no fist. But they're also, the fist or fists are conditional on the perceptive mind who has that word and that idea in their language structure already so that they can go around the world and be like, oh, look, a fist, oh, look, another fist. So these phenomena, a phenomena like a fist is complicated for a number of reasons. A, it's conditional on a bunch of other stuff. And then B, it's ultimately conditional on the mind to perceive it as such. All of that quickly, 
That was like, pew. But all of that, right? It speaks to the fist not coming from anywhere or going anywhere because it's not that kind of a thing. The grand lesson of, of Mahayana Buddhism, of course, is that all phenomena is like a fist. It is a configuration or a form that the mind has a word for in that way, but doesn't actually exist out there. It exists as an idea in here and everything is like that. So if, 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 if that was a good review and you remember the fist and you remember that dharmas neither arise nor cease, well, this beautiful idea of inexhaustibility it has a lot to do with that idea of things not ceasing. Things not coming into existence too, but in particular, if you, know, if you think of the idea of exhausted and not really tired, but if you think of the idea of like your fire dying out because it has become exhausted of wood. So you can't have a fire anymore because there's no wood. It's gone, it's done. That's the fire going out and that's the cessation of it. But if you're following me on this whole thing about all phenomena neither arising nor ceasing, but being of a very different nature, and, it, and if in particular, if you get this idea that all phenomena doesn't arise, but it doesn't cease, that's sort of pointing at this idea of inexhaustible in a way. There's a lot more to it than that. And that has to do with that even crazier idea that we've talked about, which is the Dharma Dhatu idea, which is this kind of wild way of looking at reality where any given phenomena, oh, like a clock or a hand or a fist, any given phenomena in order to be a clock or a hand or a fist, any given phenomena actually requires all other phenomena to be that phenomena. And in a very, well, this, these two ideas go back and forth, which is that if you understand that fist is a conceptual idea, then you will also understand how the idea of fist has hand in it, fingers in it, human in it, I could go on and 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 on. And in fact, inexhaustibly, I would be here forever um, articulating all of the other ideas and concepts that are built in to the idea of a fist. Joe Frazier, I go on and on. This is what I mean. It goes on and on and on and on forever. And that sort of that view of reality as, as like kind of wildly kaleidoscopic in that way speaks to this inexhaustibility. And it's why paramita means to obtain the inexhaustible Dharma treasury of the Buddha. It's that moment when you can dip into any Dharma and psh, like snakes out of the can, all the other Dharmas. So that's one. So paramita means to grasp, attain, or obtain this inexhaustible dharma treasury. Michael. Yeah, no. Is um. Is 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 timelessness? I don't know if that's what you call it. Is that part of inexhaustibility? It's um. Things. Yeah, that's. Um, everything's part of an exhaustibility at that, at that <laughs> point, the point that we were just talking about. Yeah. But I also wanted to, thanks for reminding me, I did want to try, and I didn't, but I'll do it now. I wanted to try to add time, the, the time element to when I answered Dean's question and I was trying to like samsara nirvana. I, I kind of would, would have liked to have added the time element into all of these too, that everything we've been talking about tonight, everything we have wound up talking about tonight, whether it's um, not having a fixed view and having to be in the present moment, or whether it's not being in Nirvana or Samsara, all of these things actually speak of a kind of timelessness 
or inexhaustible time in, in a certain sense, but I'm kind of going to lean more towards a timelessness or that kind of phrase of the eternal now would be a kind of way of speaking of it as well. Um, um, but yeah, otherwise known, the inexhaustibility of time, it just is because inexhaustibility goes for everything in that way. <laughs> Can I ask another question? Of course. <laughs> a little out there, but um, I know you and, you and I, we've talked uh, about what can be directly perceived in in relation to what can be learned from reading a sutra or there's you know i sort of in in my view everything that's in any sutra ever was perceived by someone at some point and can be perceived by an individual so that, I mean, I, there's value to learning these things with words and, and, and sutra study. And I always think about how can one perceive these things um, mm -hmm. oneself? How can one experience them oneself? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what my question uh, Yeah, yeah, is. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's, no, I hear you now. I mean, I mean certainly on, the obtaining of the inexhaustible Dharma treasury of the Buddha. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about timelessness in particular. Mm -hmm. the, the reason I think that's why this came up. Mm -hmm. it, there, there are times when you, you sort of have this sense of time, not of time being illusory, that it's like, there's no past, there's no future, and there's even no present. It's just sort of a, a, a thing we make up with our minds, you know, condition. So I, I don't know. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, everything that's in the sutra came from somebody's understanding, right? And the way they understood it, in addition to having, at some point, someone figured this out, is all I'm saying, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, for many, um, uh, people who have been studying with me for a while, one of the reasons why I'm so uh, into Mahayana sutras, um, I, everybody knows I, I teach I teach stuff from the Diga Nikaya, all, from the Nikayas all the time. I'm very, very um, uh, versed in the early suttas and I, I love them. They're amazing. But th those earlier suttas that are in the Nikayas, you know, those do have this sort of, um, what would you call it? They're documents in a way, meaning they're documenting an event mm -hmm. that the, the Buddha said something, oh, we better write that down. Or yes, we should remember that and then write it down later. But the point is, is that those early sutras are, you know, um, you know, this word sutra just means stitched together and literally what are being stitched together are sayings of the sage. This is the idea of a sutra is like, uh, the Buddha said this, the Buddha said that, and the Buddha said that. Well, let's stitch them together into a narrative and a stitching or suturing, suturing, that's a sutra. And the early sutras or suttas do seem to be about somebody who said something, <laughs> people who remembered what he said, and then they wrote it down. These Mahayana sutras, though, are very different. They do not present, I mean, they present themselves in a narrative way that they are an event in time at a place with the Buddha, but they know that they are literature from the beginning. So that's, that's very clear. And then you don't have to look very far to recognize that sutras, Mahayana sutras, are very aware of themselves as texts. And some people get a little put off by this, especially when the sutra is telling the reader that they should copy the sutra that they're reading. I understand that. But I want you to know that from somebody who has read a lot of sutras and taught a lot of sutras, these Mahayana sutras are more than, they're, they're, they're much more than the early suttas. And what I mean is, is that these sutras are a kind of technology. 
that uses language knowingly in a way to, to do something. And so it is actually the, the reading of these ideas in this order, in this context, that brings the, it's not the information that's in them exactly. That's what in the early suttas, it's the information that you need to read and take away the information. But what's interesting about these is, is that because they're aware of themselves as texts, they are aware of themselves as participating in a long standing sutra tradition. Say it again, they are aware of themselves as participating in a very long standing sutra tradition. So what I mean are the, there are these tropes, uh, the Ananda, thus have I heard once I was staying in this such and such a place, but these tropes, which actually in the early sutras, they become just sort of the narrative structure, but in the Mahayana sutras, it becomes a whole other thing. And, and again, in that way that they're operating like a kind of technology. And so all of these lists and lists upon lists and all of this, Yes, the information is good and important, but it's actually more about the, the what we're doing here and the, the way you go through them in a, in a process. And to actually address Noam's question about timelessness and how does one uh, experience that in a way, you know, it's like a lot of these things, it's, it's, it's sort of about observing things. And, and what I mean is, is like, so when we were talking about uh, drishtis, we were talking about views, I kept mentioning, you know, that if you get involved in a conversation with somebody that has a different view than you do, you can, if you're paying attention to your mind and your emotions, you can start to see how clingy you are to your views. Like you can use that conversation as an opportunity to see and be like, oh, okay, this is attached to that. And actually I think, I think this because of this, like you can start to see these kind of dharmic relations in that way. And then by observing them, you kind of disconnect them and there's, there's change in that way. I think the same thing happens with timelessness in that way that we start to notice the, the subtle things that are giving us the idea that time is happening anyways. And then beginning to, like one that comes to mind, I spend a lot of time thinking about time and discussing time in that way. And one of the deep realizations that, um, that chrononauts, time travelers, time thinkers, one of the deep realizations that people who think about time, one, one of the realizations they come to is how the, the way our grammar is structured creates a concept of time. Because it's subject, verb, object, because there's this, it's, it's like built into the way we think. It's like this flow of it subject doing something to somebody that cre actually creates time. And this is, um, there's um, various uh, linguists, uh, there's a few I'm thinking of, but Wittgenstein and Chomsky are two, but who are very, uh, have, have noted this, that there is a time built into the way our grammar works, English grammar, but most grammar functions in this way and that because we think in language, that we create this perception of things happening in a certain fashion, which would be temporally. The idea being that if we could sort of rewire that, of course, or get rid of it, things could be different. And of course, this is actually, now that I'm remembering it, this is the premise of that film, The Arrival. If anybody's seen this, uh, the, it came out a while ago about this spaceship that lands and there's a scientist woman that goes in and she's in charge with communicating with them. And they're actually rewiring her linguistic structure so that she is actually becomes 
out of time or something or something happens with her perception of time because they have linguistically changed her uh, linguistic structure. And the whole premise of the film actually is that our perception of time is based in language and the way that we speak. It's fascinating. So my point being, Noam, is that you, if you put on your little Dharma hat and observe, you can start to notice connections between things as subtle as that, perception of time and language. And then sometimes that can then bring about that timelessness or at least bring one closer to it. All right. Okay. Any other questions, ideas, comments? That was a quick. One. I have one. Yeah. Is that kind of like um, the observer collapsing the wave? Because there's a, an observer, there's time. Are you talking about like the whole, uh, the whole, the whole, the, 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 the experiment and the split and yeah, kind of a thing. Um. I would do. I mean, I don't want to get too crazy, but Robert, but I think it's a factor. Mm, yeah, it's yeah. not a well thought out question. No, no, but I, I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Okay. After paramita means to obtain the inexhaustible dharma treasury of the Buddha, the next ten in the list, which I will basically skip because there's one or two I want to get to. But the next 10 are actually, uh, for example, he says that paramita means to, uh, um, to uh, it's tricky language, uh, normally this word would be save, like save, save all sentient beings. You've heard this language, to save all sentient beings. But I've said so many times, bodhisattvas don't save sentient beings. There's this verb in Chinese and a verb in Sanskrit that sort of means like, it kind of means to help out, but like to help out in a very like serious way. And so they talk about uh, delivering, delivering sentient beings or saving sentient beings. I don't want you to get too hung up on the bad translation, but what paramita means is to help out, to deliver all sentient beings by giving. So he's about to go back through all the paramitas and then to say that paramita means to completely fulfill one's original vow by moral discipline, to achieve adornments of majesty uh, or, or to, ador to achieve majestic adornments through patience. And he goes through all the paramitas and gives these kind of very beautiful descriptions of them within the context of paramita. And I mentioned this last time, I didn't mention at the beginning, all 30 of these, they all have a verb in them that alludes to paramita, this kind of crossing over. So for, for example, when it says to deliver all sentient beings, that word deliver actually is taking the place of that idea of paramita. So it's like, it's, so this is what I meant uh, last week too, where it's like, it's a beautiful form of poetry where it's a, it's a riff on a theme, the theme of deliverance in that way, all right? So he goes through all the beautiful paramitas. Um, then at number 18, we obtain to what, or we find out that paramita means to obtain the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. And that's an idea that we talk about a lot in the Dharma doors. It's this certain point in the maturation process of the Bodhisattva. So we already talked about the birthlessness of all phenomena. That was the neither arising nor ceasing. It's like the fist. The fist doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't go from anywhere you could call the fist birthless, manufactureless, or originless. It is without origin. It has no point of origin. 
and it has no point of decay. It's not that kind of entity. And if, if you get that about the fist, that it doesn't come from anywhere and it doesn't go from anywhere, that's birth, the birthlessness of the fist. Okay, that's kind of just understanding what this thing, the language means, birthlessness. It's a weird idea, right? But then you can have, so not just, so there, the first move is just understanding what that means. You don't have to like agree or have a, epiphanies about it. It's just, that's, that's what they're talking about. Then you could actually have a, a deep realization about the birthlessness of all things. Like you could really, and by the way, fists, yeah, sure, that's easy. But you get to start getting into some other things and start talking about the birthlessness of these things. And it can get a little uh, like, well, okay, but that's not a fist you didn't realize. That's a building or that's, you know. And then of course, the birthlessness of oneself, the birthlessness of all sentient beings. So the first thing is you just find out about this thing, <laughs> that there is such an idea that things may not be happening the way we think they're happening. They might be concepts forming together in a giant conceptual matrix, might be. So there's this first thing of just what's going on. Then you might have the actual deep epiphany about the birthlessness of things, that everything is like a fist, meaning a conceptual idea in that way. And then you would kind of, that process culminates in what is called the kashanti, the patient endurance for the anupata, the, the non-origination of dharmas. Not samudpata, if you're, if you're familiar with pratitya samupata, that's upata birthed together, samupata. This is a deeper teaching about the anupata, no origination, we're not even originating together in a co-originating way anymore. It's actually just non-origination, non-birth. And so again, you can, you can know that there is such a thing. You can grok it like really deeply. And then you actually arrive at this place that is called this patient endurance for the birthlessness of all things. And it's a very interesting idea um that that to how can i put it that to deal with that to 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 relate to that to relate to that idea of birthlessness it actually culminates in a a, a patience and and if you've never thought about the birthlessness of all things, then you might just still be wrestling with that in a way. But if you've thought about the birthlessness of phenomena, this teaching, then the, the idea is, is like, huh, that's very interesting that it requires this kind of patient endurance or almost patient tolerance for that, that that's what's going on. I'm not really going to say too much more about that idea, unless you want me to. Well, yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do really find that language really intriguing because like tolerance, mm -hmm. patient endurance, it sounds like, like, um, like the understanding that there's the birthlessness of everything's um, is unpleasant in some way by using that language, or maybe I'm just, you know, um, by using tolerance or patient mm -hmm. endurance, um, that there's some sort of edginess to it that's uncomfortable. Yeah, and I, I, I hear well, you. Know, so, but I don't know if that's if that's intent. I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, if that's intended or not. But you kind of see where I'm going. I do. I do. I think it. it I think it cuts a lot of different ways. And I think that there is a certain, especially for, I, I, I have, um, it wasn't and hasn't been my reaction, but I have definitely encountered those whose reaction is 
a degree of sadness about this idea. There is something a little something about it. And I don't actually think that that's what's being referred to necessarily is that this is like a, a sad revelation of things in that way. But I do think that it, 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 well, when I said it cuts a number of different ways, the one way would be that, yeah, I mean, the one way would be to see it as a, as a, a little sad in that way. That's one way it cuts, but more importantly, there are two other ways I'm thinking of that this cuts that's very interesting is that it has a lot to do with the understanding and realization of the birthlessness of oneself. And that's something that requires a little bit of patient endurance to like, <laughs> yeah. And also others as well in that way. And then another way, another way that this cuts that requires that patience is the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva is going to encounter some people who don't see it that way. And that's going to require patient endurance. Because this world, of course, is predicated on the idea that things are very much born and die, created and destroyed. So there is this juicy spot when things exist that you got to get it while you can. And so since the whole samsaric realm and whole samsaric world is operating on the principle of things existing in a certain way, which is as individuated entities that come in and out of existence, you, it might require some patient endurance to, to be, to have that view is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's what really what I want to get at is that to really have that view. And it's not a view. It's not a view. Don't, <laughs> don't make it a view <laughs> to practice or something. But the idea is those that to be practicing in that way, put it that way, to be practicing that way might run up against opposition in a certain way. And so it will take that patient in, uh, tolerance to kind of work through that in a way. Yeah. Any questions, comments, ideas about that? So I'm only going to do two more <laughs> because we only have seven minutes. So, you know, we'll do two. Uh, <laughs> um, but I actually just wanted to mention this beautiful one. It's I, I spent a lot of time on this one, which is the on translating this one. So it's number 24 if you have the book or you're or you're looking at it and i forget they trans like the normal book because you know everybody knows this is usually coming from this book a treasury of mahayana sutras um but i'm doing my own translation so the way they translate number 24 is oh yeah see this is terrible so they they translate it as to gain command of the four bases of miraculous powers okay so the four bases of miraculous powers we're talking about the siddhis or riddhis so sometimes it's they're called riddhis and sometimes they're called siddhis and those words are very related in in, in a way and that the supernormal powers are, of course, like things like reading people's minds, being able to pass through solid objects, levitation, flight, all kinds of miraculous supernormal powers. Those are the Siddhis. I've done a lot of talks on the Siddhis. Buddha did not make this up. This is an old part of the meditation world. It's in Buddhism, but these supernatural powers are symptoms of cultivation or byproducts of a cultivation practice. They're not the goal. In the Bodhisattva practice, they become very interesting because they become um, means of teaching or means of communicating the Dharma to others. And there are these sort of traditional four steps or four bases of developing these supernatural powers. 
um i won't go off on that because i actually do really want to do the other one that i want to do but i just wanted to share with you that it's a shame because this uh what did they call it to gain command it's not what it says at least in chinese it's this beautiful um term and so so he translate the original the other one translates as the four bases but base isn't the right word these are actual the four steps like a four-step process so these are the four steps and so they use this beautiful word which means to ramble or wander and so what it actually says is that what paramita means is to ramble the path of the siddhis or to wander along the path of the siddhis but in sanskrit and chinese it's a double entendre it's like this beautiful like double way of using the word step or base so it's just a really beautiful and and i was was hoping to say a little bit more about all that but just wanted to share with you that after that is our neither abiding in samsara nor nirvana and then finally perfect timing the very last one number 30 so they i i this is tricky. So they translate it as, and what does paramita mean? Number 30, to turn the 12 kinds of Dharma wheels. When I read that, and it has a, they have a, a footnote here. Their footnote, the editor footnote says, we are not sure of the identity of the 12 kinds of Dharma wheels. Well, that's because it's not 12 kinds of Dharma wheels. They, it's misreading the Chinese and uh, whatever. So what this is a re reference to is the very, 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 very first sutra, the Dharma Chakra Pavartana Sutra, turning the Dharma wheel sutra. This is where the Buddha to the five ascetics in the Deer Park first uh, uh, expounds the Four Noble Truths teaching. And in that sutra, he does the formula, which I said one, one, of, one night here, I, I mentioned this, that in that sutra, the Buddha talks about turning the Dharma wheel. And he talks about how these four noble truths have these three ways of approaching them. One is this indicative mode where they, where, where they are stated. This is the noble truth of suffering. This is the noble truth of the cause. This is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And this is the path that leads to it. FYI, it literally is like the first turning is, is for your information. There are these four noble truths. The second turning of these four noble truths is a sort of um, what would be called like an imperative mode or something, but this idea that, that these four noble truths should be understood. So you don't, these are not, uh, you know, just rumor that you should he have heard about. The second way is knowing that they should be understood. That this isn't just idle chit chat, idle chatter and rumor, but that these are at Four Noble Truths should be understood. So the first way is just hearing about them. The second is considering these Four Noble Truths as something that you should understand. And then the third turning of these Four Noble Truths is the having fully understood these Four Noble Truths. So they should be understood and then they have been. And the Buddha says in that sutra that he only declared himself or whatever a Tathagata, a fully enlightened being after he had turned these four truths in those three ways. And even in that sutra, he says these 12, he, he makes reference to the number 12, the, these 12 Dharma wheels in a way. And I'm pretty sure that that is what number 30 is referring to. What does paramita mean? It means that you've heard about this stuff, you know this stuff should be understood and it has been fully understood. That 
is my interpretation of the last one, which is to turn these 12 kinds of Dharma wheels. That's the idea. Which again, when I said that, whatever night I said that, I was, I was emphasizing that this tradition, this Buddhist path is all about self-realization. And by that, I mean that one comes to these realizations themselves. No, none of this, none of this is a piece of information that I have or the sutra has that as soon as you have this piece of information, you'll, you'll be good. You, like, you just need to hear it. It's not the way this works. Each of us has to actually realize this ourselves. And the Buddha says, I, and I don't claim to have done that until I had turned these things, these truths, these three ways. So paramita, that idea of paramita is also definitely about that self-realization in that sense of realizing things for oneself, not realizing the true self as it, it does mean in some traditions. So, okay, that's it. Questions, answers, comments, ideas, epiphanies, realizations. I tried and t time, time wise, I tried. <laughs> have you ever thought, have you ever thought of like, right? I mean, cause you find all these really cool things in your own, um, uh, you know, translation and stuff that these books are missing completely. Yeah. Like, I mean, and it seems to me that it would be great to get it out there. Have you ever thought of like, writing these things up like because it's like I mean like the one you just said like yeah. yeah I mean like you know it seems like sometimes they're missing the boat maybe or, or who, who knows or it's just I mean but I don't know I, yeah 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 what you say makes sense to me no no don't worry um if you don't know every dharma doors I've I've done pretty much ever oh no 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 that's not true uh ever since we started doing it on zoom um, I have been doing my own translation of the Vimalakirti. When we did Vimalakirti Sutra a year ago, I worked on my own translation of that. Every sutra we've done from this book, I've done my own translation. And I, of course, many people know I translate the Vajra Sutra or the Diamond Sutra. I kind of basically translate it once a year kind of a thing. I'm like, I'm really, really uh, close to like a good translation of that sutra, which doesn't exist yet. And that's not a uh, putting anybody else's down or putting mine up. It's just a reality of the way these things read in the original, whether it's Chinese or Sanskrit. And then when they read it in English, when I read it in English, it's like, that's not the sutra. It's just not the sutra. <laughs> yes, it's the words. Yes, it's the ideas, but it's not it. I'm very close with the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra that should be available at some point soon within like a month or two, like very, very close. And then I'm on to the next with like another suture from here. And so don't worry, they're all going to come out eventually. I have them all done, like more or less. So that would be great. Cause I yeah. think, I mean, there's, that would be a wonderful gift to the world. I mean, like for it to be available, you know, and put it out there. Yeah. It, it's been my mission. Like, and I use that word kind of, carefully in that way. It's been my mission actually for a while to not just do translations, but to produce a, a body of them where they all use the same words for the same ideas. Mm -hmm. That is what the, what the English speaking world needs the most is that so many people could learn on their own if these sutras were consistent in the way they translated ideas because you would be able to go back and forth and be like, oh, in this sutra, he says vinyana or consciousness is this, this, and that. But when people are translating these words all these different ways, and then what's even worse, the same translator in the same book will just like, oh, well, I'll use this word. Oh, uh, now it's like the radiant mind. And, and it's like, no, 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 no radiant mind. No, this like stick to the Dharma. So I think it would be a really, uh, I, I agree, it would be a really good gift to have a, um, a consistent vocabulary. So I'm working on it. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.
All right. Thank you, everybody. By the way, I just a big, huge thank you to everybody for the just the support you all give me in so many ways. It's like the it's a very, 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 very grateful. Likewise, Michael. Thank you, Michael.